we come to chapter 14 in Genesis where we see war mentioned for the first time in the Bible. It's a war between two confederations of kings, four kings against five kings. These kings are mentioned in, in verses 1 and 2, and uh, it says in verse 2 that they made war. And in the pro progress of that war, Lot is kidnapped. He's taken captive or taken hostage. Now think about this situation. Lot made his choice about where he was going to live. Lot cheated Abram. Lot took the best of the land and left the land which wasn't so good or wasn't as good for Abram. Now he's in trouble. What does the righteous man do? Does the righteous man say, well, you reap what you sow? Does the righteous man say, well, he had it coming to him? Does the righteous man say he has to deal with the consequences of his choices? There's nothing I can do about it? No. The righteous man who thought he was too old to have children, at least he knew his wife was, decides that he's not too old to go to war. Think about that. The righteous man goes to war and risks his life to save the unrighteous man. It's a pattern of redemption. When it says in verse 12 that Lot was taken, they took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed for he was living in Sodom. Abram very quickly finds out. By the way, in verse 13, the word Hebrew is used for the first time in the Bible. A fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Abram was living by the oaks of Mamre. Now look at verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he acted immediately. He didn't wait. He acted immediately. He led out his trained men. He was prepared. The men were already, had already been trained. And he pursued them as far as Dan. And in this place called Dan, he divided his forces and he surprised them by night. And look at verse 16. He brought back all. He brought back all. Let me tell you something about Jesus. The second Adam retrieves more than the first Adam lost. Whatever we lose by sin, Jesus can restore that and more to us by righteousness, by His own righteousness. He brings back everything. He brings back Lot. He brings back the women, the family, the people everybody. Now, um, the carnal man gets into trouble, and he can only be rescued by the man who's not carnal, by the man who's spiritual. We have that pattern very, very early in the Bible. Now, what follows is one of the most mysterious stories in the Bible. Abram had just gotten himself involved in a war between nine kings, including the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. In verse 18, uh, he meets another king, a king called Melchizedek or Melchizedek. Melchizedek is taken from two Hebrew words, which mean the king of righteousness. He is the king of Salem. Salem means peace. So we have someone whose name is the king of righteousness, who's also the king of peace. And this place named Salem will become, in the future, Jerusalem. He is the king of Jerusalem. Yerushalayim, which means the foundation of peace. 
we get the word shalom from the same word that we get the word Salem from. So Melchizedek is the king of Salem, the king, king of shalom, the king of peace, the king of Jerusalem. And it says that he was a priest of God most high. Well, there are lots of, there are lots of things going on here. And um, we'll start out on the edge and move toward the center. First of all, how does he know God? How does he worship the one true God? When we become Christians, we become very, very troubled and concerned by this doctrine called hell. And I think the thing that's so hard about hell is not the fact that it's such an uncomfortable place but the fact that it's a place we can never get out of. It's a, for, it's a forever place. I told you yesterday that many people react in different ways to the doctrine of hell. Some people become unbelievers. Some people become universalists. Some people become annihilationists. And we talked about what those things are yesterday. What God wants us to do is to become evangelists, to become missionaries. I'm very bothered by the doctrine of hell myself. It's a painful thing to think about. That's one reason I became a missionary. It's one of the biggest reasons I became a missionary. Because I don't like the idea of anyone going to hell. We must be very careful that we don't make mercy and grace wider than the Bible makes it. There are some people who believe that uh, those who haven't heard will come to heaven, will be in heaven. The Bible does not teach that. If the Bible taught that, we would be very, very foolish to become missionaries. Because as we encounter people who haven't heard, they may be okay because of their ignorance. Then if we tell them the gospel, and they reject the gospel, we bring their souls into danger. So you see, if the people who hadn't heard are okay, or if they have their own chance to go to heaven, then the missionary enterprise achieves just the opposite of what we would want it to achieve. Instead of rescuing people from hell, we would put people in danger of going to hell by telling them the truth about God through Christ. Having said that, we do have occasions in the Scripture where we see that God has worked in ways that we don't know about. We see places where God has brought people to Himself apparently without any missionaries, apparently without any written Scripture. Somehow He's brought the truth to people and has brought them into a right relationship with God. Perhaps the Magi were in that category. Those men from the East who visited Christ in Matthew chapter 2. I'm not saying that we know for sure that they were saved men before they began the search, but they were seeking Christ, and they did find Him, and they did worship Him. The question is, how did they know who to look for? It may be that they had a fragment of Daniel's prophecy, but we don't know that. Here we have the case of a man who doesn't have a Bible because there is no Bible. Here we have the case of a man who lives outside the nation of Israel because there is no nation of Israel. And here we have a man who's not only a believer in the one true God, but he's a priest. And if he's a priest, who does he minister to? Who are the other believers? Now, I know some people who think that Melchizedek is an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. And there are some verses which make us think 
that he's not merely a man. We find those verses in, in the book of Hebrews. But I think it's probably safer to say that he is a picture of Christ. He is a pattern of Christ. And this is what the he book of Hebrews is saying. We'll look at Hebrews in a moment. Uh, Melchizedek is mentioned in Hebrews 5, Hebrews 6, and Hebrews 7. But here he appears on the pages of the Old Testament in a brief meeting with Abram in Genesis 14, never to appear again. He is mentioned in Psalm 110, but he doesn't appear again until we have an amazing, amazing doctrine taught about him in the epistle to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Well, what happens? Abram is returning from this great, great victory. And while he's returning, he meets this mysterious man whose name means king of righteousness. This man who is a king and a priest. He's the king of Jerusalem. And he's also the priest of the Most High God. And it says in verse 19 that when Melchizedek meets Abram that he blesses him. Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now I told you that we have many important themes which we see for the first time in chapter 14. One of those themes is war. One of those, one of those words is Hebrew. One of those words is Melchizedek. And one of those themes is tithe. The tithe shows up for the first time at the end of Genesis 14 as Abram gives a tithe, a tenth of all he has to Melchizedek. Um, we have to talk about Melchizedek just for a moment before we leave this chapter because he is so important in terms of New Testament theology. In the Old Testament economy, in the law of Moses, a priest had to be from the tribe of Levi, and a king had to be from the tribe of Judah. Therefore, a king could not be a priest, and a priest could not be a king because they were from different tribes. This would have been a problem for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our prophet, our priest, and our king. How can Christ be our, our, our priest? Because he's from the tribe of Judah, the royal line. He's not from the tribe of Levi. Well, um, let me share another perspective on that. If you ever visit Jerusalem, you will probably go to the Mount of Olives. If you don't go to the Mount of Olives, you'll at least see the Mount of Olives. You'll look out on the Mount of Olives, which lies east of the city. There's a the eastern gate of the city is sealed. There are other gates, the Jaffa Gate, the Damascus Gate, there are other gates that are open. But the eastern gate is sealed. This is the gate that Jesus went through on, the, on Palm Sunday during his triumphal procession into Jerusalem. And um, when we read Zechariah 14, we discover that the Messiah will touch down on top of the Mount of Olives. When we read Acts 1, we discover that the Messiah left from the Mount of Olives. Now, I can't prove it, but I believe that Jesus will touch down on the same footprint that he left from. Between the Mount of Olives and the eastern gate of Jerusalem, um, there's a slope, the western slope of the Mount of Olives. There's a valley that's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. There is a, a brook there, the brook Kedar. There is a, 
a garden when you go up the eastern slope of Jerusalem, the famous Garden of Gethsemane. And then there's the sealed gate. I, I expect, though I, I can't prove, that that gate will be sealed until the Messiah comes. It's been sealed for over 500 years. There's no logistical reason why it should have been sealed. There is a prophecy of the sealing, though, in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, and I imagine that Jesus will walk through that eastern gate and it will be open to him when he returns. Now, there's something else between the, the top of the Mount of Olives and that eastern gate. There are graveyards. There are Jewish graveyards and there are Muslim graveyards. And they're there for very different reasons. The Jewish graveyards are there because Jews who can afford it and Jews who have the opportunity want to be buried between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem because they believe the prophecy of Zechariah and they believe that when the Messiah comes, he's going to walk that path. So they want to be closest to the Messiah when he comes so they can be first at the resurrection. That's the Jewish motive for wanting a graveyard between the Mount of Olives and the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem. The Muslims have a very different motive. They believe that it was forbidden for a Jewish priest to walk through a graveyard or to be present in the graveyard of those who are not Jews. So they believe that by putting their graves in between the Garden of e uh, the, the um, Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane and the Eastern Gate, that they can keep the Messiah out of Jerusalem. Now, have you ever heard of anything so silly? The fact is, maybe they would have had an argument if Jesus were an Old Testament priest if he were a priest according to the tribe of Levi, according to the order of Aaron. But Jesus is not a Levitical priest. Jesus is not a priest according to the order of Aaron. The book of Hebrews says, in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, that Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, let me just say, that that is a breathtaking argument. And if we didn't have those three chapters in Hebrews, we could have studied the Bible for 10,000 years and we probably would never have come up with that argument. It would probably have never occurred to anybody. But God the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of the book of Hebrews with the truth of that reality. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. I'll show you one more thing, which is even more mysterious. It also has to do with um, something I said about original sin back in Genesis 3 when I told you that I believe that Adam is more than our federal head, our representative, our governmental representative. Most Christian theologians believe that we sinned when Adam sinned because he's our federal head, he's our representative. So as he represents us when he sins, we're responsible to, uh, for sin as well. I think it may be something more than that, something deeper than that. And one of the reasons that I believe that is because of this great argument that the writer of Hebrews makes. Um, the writer of Hebrews attributes the reference in Psalm 110 to Melchizedek to Christ. Hebrews 5, verse 5, Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest on his own, but his Father says to him, God says to him, You are my Son, today I have begot begotten you. Just as he also says in another passage, this is Psalm 110, 4, 
You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So we take that. I said we wouldn't have figured it out in 10,000 years. We wouldn't have applied it in the way that the writer of Hebrews applies it because he goes on. And he talks about in verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10, that Christ has been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, he doesn't bring Melchizedek up again until the end of chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 20. He talks about Jesus entering the veil of the temple for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Then in Hebrews 7, the writer talks about Melchizedek. He talks about how Abraham met him when he was returning from the slaughter of kings. And he said that, um, that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Then he makes an amazing argument. Um, first he says in verse 4 that Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. If Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, then, Abraham, then Melchizedek must be greater than Abraham. Also, Melchizedek blesses Abraham, verse 6, Hebrews 7, 6. And he says in verse 7 that it is the greater one who blesses the lesser one. But the really, really amazing argument he makes is this. Levi is a descendant of Abraham. And the writer argues that Levi was present in Abraham, that is in Abraham's seed, when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, just as we were present in Adam when Adam sinned. That's my connection to original sin by analogy. So he says, since the children of Abraham, including Levi, the head of the priestly tribe, and Aaron, who was appointed the priest, since they were present in their father Abraham when he paid tithes to Melchizedek, then the priesthood of Aaron has paid tithes to the priest Melchizedek, which means that the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of Levi and Aaron. It's a breathtaking argument. It is a very sophisticated argument. And I go to the New Testament and I go to the book of Hebrews just to um, emphasize what an important meeting this is and how significant it is that as Abram returns from the war and returns from rescuing the hostage Lot, he pays tithes to this mysterious priest of God whom he has fellowship with. He has spiritual fellowship with him. They worship together. And Abram supports his ministry by giving him a tithe. Now something else happens in chapter 14 that's very important. While, while Abram is returning from this great military victory, the king of Sodom approaches him. Now, the king of Sodom had been defeated by the kings that Abram had just defeated. And so, the king of Sodom comes to him and tries to make a deal with him over the booty, the treasure, that Abram had won from these kings whom he had defeated. And Abram says in verse 23, I'm not going to take anything from you. Nobody's ever going to say that you made me rich. So see, here are two kings who represent two kingdoms. There's the king of Jerusalem, whom Abram fellowships with, worships with, and pays tithes to and there's the king of Sodom. And he will not let the king of Sodom give him anything. You see, this cycle begins in chapter 13 by Lot taking from the treasure of the world 
and making that choice. The cycle ends in chapter 14 with Abram refusing to be enriched by the world. Remember what my friend told me. You don't ever want anything that God doesn't give to you. Abram is willing to be rich, and he was rich, but he's only willing to be rich if God makes him rich. So we want to be careful who we give to and who we receive from. And we see all these spiritual principles and lessons embedded in the larger story of the wars among the kings and the nephew of Abraham who's caught in the middle of the wars and taken a hostage and how the godly man goes to rescue the carnal man.